lot of times we're bringing our customer through our process instead of tailoring our process to the customer's need. For me, the future of digital customer success is, is ultimately like one customer centric overlay so they can engage with all of their information as, as, uh, as they choose. And once again, welcome to the Digital Customer Success Podcast with me, Alex Turkovich. So glad you could join us here today and every week as I seek out and interview leaders and practitioners who are innovating and building great scaled CS programs. My goal is to share what I've learned and to bring you along with me for the ride so that you get the insights that you need to build and evolve your own digital CS program. If you'd like more info, want to get in touch or sign up for the latest updates, go to digitalcustomersuccess.com. And if you have a question or commentary to be used in an upcoming episode, call us and leave a message at 512-222-7381. For now, let's get started. Welcome to episode 17 of the show. Uh, I can't believe we're getting close to 20. It seems like yesterday we started, but it's been a few months. Uh, been a few months of great conversations. It's been a uh, uh, a few months of growth. August was great. September is even better, and uh, that's all because of you and your listenership and your engagement and uh, the the people that I've interacted with um, since we started the show. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to every single one of those people um, because there have been amazing amazing conversations. <laughs> So before we get into today's uh, interview, if you're a regular listener, you know that uh, we recently launched a call-in line, and I basically invited you to call in, leave your commentary and your questions, and we would um, field them on the air, so to speak. Um, And so uh, we got a couple of messages here. I wanted to play them for you um, today, and uh, we can talk about them after we listen to them. So here we go. Here's the first one. Hey there, Alex. First time caller, long time listener, Brittany Hillard here. Hello, Brittany. I actually have a favor. I would love for you to interview yourself. I'd love to hear more about what you're doing in your role, uh, your previous role, kind of all the things you've learned um, by doing and obviously through your network. I think it'd be pretty interesting. So, yeah, looking forward to that episode. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I have actually, um, I'm planning and have thought about doing some solo episodes on digital CS, um, you know, because it is my day gig at the moment. And, um, and uh, I think it would be good to to do some really focused episodes on some specific topics. So um, thanks for the call, Brittany. I, w- I will definitely tackle some solo episodes in the future. And it looks like we got another one in um, maybe also from Brittany. So let's, uh, let's listen to that one. Hey there, Alex. Brittany Hillard again. Hello, Brittany again. Um, I have another request. I love to listen to the podcast while I am driving or out walking around. And I don't usually have like a pen and paper or, you know, something easy handy to take notes with. Um, or if I'm driving, I probably shouldn't be doing that. Probably not. So my favorite is at the end of the podcast when your guests are sharing all their gems about the people they follow or the books they've read, their go-to um, knowledge resources, any way you could aggregate that similar to how you do the um, DCS definition, that would be amazing uh, for me and for all the other drivers on the road <laughs> that are driving around me. All right. Can't wait to hear this. Bye. Awesome. Uh, first off, Brittany, thank you so much for your contribution and calling in. Uh, super valuable and uh, appreciated hearing from you. Um, on that last one, the short answer is yes. I actually, I've been planning on pulling together a resources page. In fact, by the time you're listening to this, there should be a resources page on the website, digitalcustomersuccess.com, that you can go to. And it will actually have a digest of all of the resources and links and recommendations that all of our guests have made uh, in the past, all in one page. And uh, also going forward, we'll, you know, continue adding to it as, uh, as the episodes go. So um, awesome. Yeah, how, how, uh, how fortuitous. So yeah, thanks again for the call. I really appreciate it. If you uh, would like to call in and contribute and ask a question, please feel free to do so at 
Today's conversation is with someone that you will likely know because of the Customer Success Excellence Awards. In fact, he is the founder of the Customer Success Excellence Awards. We have a, uh, a meeting of the Alexes today uh, because today we're talking with Alex Farmer. Alex currently serves as CCO of Nizaza, um, which is travel tech, um, but I think more importantly, he is a self-proclaimed startup lifer um he is he is kind of that that's his sweet spot and his comfort zone is startups and so uh this conversation is great because we talk about digital cs in the context of a startup um of course we also talk about the cs excellence awards and whatnot um so i'm looking forward to your feedback and hope you enjoy this conversation with alex farmer i know i sure did i'm with the eye of the hurricane Alex, that's how I feel right now here with you. Really? I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. (laughs) Well, I think it's good because my day's been a hurricane and the eye is where everything's everything's good, right? So I could be implying, of course, it's about to get real shitty for the next 30 minutes. And like, you know, I'm in the eye of the hurricane because we haven't started yet. (laughs) But we're going to find out together. There you go. It's going to be great. Alex Farmer, it's very nice to have you on the podcast. Welcome, welcome. It's great to be here. As you said, the summit of the Alexes. Here we are. The summit of the Alexes. There's there's some amazing Alexes in the world, but it's not it's not crazy common. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is also Alex. It's a fun fact off the bat. So Wow. Um, yeah, that's uh it's more often than you know there's a summit so of the Alexes. Are you legally an Alexander and she's legally an Alexandra? Is that it how is that true. is? It that is, is true. true. The fact I can confirm the rumor. Alex, mm-hmm. indeed. Yeah. Makes it's it a amazing. little easier. It makes, <laughs> makes it a little bit easier. A lot of people, I don't know if you get this, but for some reason, a lot of people call me Eric. Like, a lot of people call me Eric. So I, I see you on a screen now. Do you look like an Eric? I don't know. I might. I'm gonna, I mean, I guess we're playing this game now. I'm going to give you Ryan vibes. I'm going to say that you, look, you might look like a Ryan to me. So I, now everyone... Yeah, yeah, everyone can call you that now. Um, I think that's that's why you brought me on the show. I assume. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you get? Yeah. Do you have a name that people call you a lot? Uh, they're never. They're not. They're, they can't be repeated in polite company. Not flattering. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Let's just go with that. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I'm excited to have you on for a couple of different reasons. One is you've got a pretty cool career. You involve yourself with some amazing companies, and you're, you know like you said, you're kind of this, you're, you said earlier when we started off that you're kind of in the eye of the hurricane, I would argue that you are the hurricane. You, you, you are like the one that just gets stuff done in a very positive, I meant that in a very positive way. But um, uh, you know, also, I'm here, to, I'm here to break things. I'm here to break things. Alex. That's you're exactly. here to break things, break yeah. the norm. Um, you know, but also you, you are the person behind um, these lovely customer success excellence awards that we've been hearing so much about. And, and uh, you guys just did a, um, an America session at Pulse, which was great, really well received. Uh, so congrats on that. But um, yeah, so excited to dig into all that. But um, I guess first would be great to, uh, I guess, get your kind of CS origin story and, and what led you down the CS and and, and, and really the customer facing path. Yeah. Um, so, so my role today, I'll, I'll go back in history in a second. I'm the chief customer officer at Nizaza. And, and when I interview folks at Nizaza, I, I can confidently say that I've done every role within the post-sale journey uh, in my career. So yeah. I could say, so, some say master of none. I, I had no comment. Uh, but, but that you know, it's been a privilege to kind of do and learn the disciplines of kind of the CX or post-sale organization throughout my career, support, onboarding, and customer success. Uh, yeah. I joined uh, originally from San Francisco Bay Area. I'm here in London. It's been here 10 years now. Um, but my CS origin story, after spending a little time doing software implementation and then a little time doing customer support, uh, I joined a company as Employee 32, a company called Fairsale, based in the UK as Employee 32. Uh, and I think I was 24 years old. It was like two years <sighs> of my career. And uh, cool. remember my, my boss that hired me after he, a couple of years after he hired me, he said, I didn't really know what we were hiring you for, but we just kind of took a punt. He said, took a punt on you, basically. 
I stuck around there for five years, but uh, I started there actually doing support and then a little implementation. And during the interview process, he told me, you know, as I just said, we don't exactly know the role, but learn the product, do some implementation, do some support. And we kind of agreed with each other. We'd reevaluate in six to 12 months. And I remember it was January 1st, January 3rd or something, 2015. And I saw on LinkedIn, he posted a job for customer success manager. And I hadn't really heard of mm. that before. And I look, read the job description. Um, and uh, it sounded perfect. It was, you needed to know the product, which I had spent a lot of time doing and enjoy the sure. technology. Mm -hmm. You needed to, what well, the thing I really didn't, didn't like about implementation was if you didn't like the project or the people, you're stuck there for three to six months. Yeah. But it's one project, it's five projects, but, but being right. able to have the commercial conversation and have a portfolio of customers, all of those things. So it was different every day. Uh, all of those things was, was super interesting to me. And I had a, a real interest in traveling as well. So going out and seeing customers, 24 years old, you know, getting on airplanes, that felt pretty cool too. So yeah. that's the origin if you like. I like it. That's cool. Did you in your, I, I know I, I spent some time in, uh, kind of implementation professional services, um, you know, type gigs as well. And, uh, it was always staggering to me the amount of time where a, a, a project or an onboarding project would come your way and you would invariably end up having to resell the platform to the people who were actually on the phone that and, and where the decision maker was like nowhere to be found is it i mean i think we can all kind of relate to that but yeah. our, you know i would imagine you especially in, in this i would imagine in this in this startup environment kind of small company environment that's especially true yeah you know it was it was an hr tech platform so at least they weren't buying you know kind of an add-on it was we're ripping out our old system bringing in a new system right so they kind of in some ways knew what the product did I think the, the the devil was in the details, you know, because there was so much, one of our strengths, we were, we were we, the company was called Ferris Sales, an HR, uh, Salesforce based HR tech system. So basically you log into Salesforce, you look at your opportunities, separate section, you can look at your people data or your profile. Sure. Um, and uh, Salesforce, as many people know, has a lot of configuration and configurability. So we would say yes. Well, sales would say yes to a lot of RFP questions that, sometimes turned into yes and, or yes, but, or maybe not. And I think that was the expectation management that we had to do. Uh, uh, so at least we could, you know, at least we had flexibility, but with great flexibility comes, you know, all the caveats and the challenges that you can imagine. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is the digital customer success podcast. I would be remiss if I didn't ask all of my guests um, the same question, which is to say, you know, what's when you hear the word digital customer success or the, or the, the function of digital customer success, what's mm -hmm. your kind of elevator pitch definition of it if you had to describe it to somebody else? Yeah, elevate. It might be a long elevator ride or a bumpy one. So go with me here. Um, sure. I, you know, well, let me answer your question. But first, say I, I spent most of my career in really high touch CS. Um, and those are not opposites, digital and high touch. But I think sometimes they incorrectly get conflated as opposites. But Totally. I guess this is a newer area for me, let's say. Uh, I think it's part of the definition, honestly. It's, you know. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm kind of, you know, sideways. And, snuck and the just so you know, like there. everybody's definition has been completely different. There's some, you know, there's some storylines that kind of fit yeah. among the whole thing. But that's the reason why I ask is because, um, you know, everybody has their own take based on their background and what they do and where they are and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so. I, Alex, I was just trying to lower the bar before I give it to you. So, so there you go. Bar successfully lowered, I hope. And let's maybe give an attempt at an answer here. Um, elevator pitch for digital CS. I mean, I, I think digital customer success is about scalability and it's about accessibility. And I think we, we talk about scalability a lot. That's obvious. Doing more with yep. less, less one-to-one, -one, more one-to-many. But what we don't talk about enough is accessibility, i.e. I uh, have a QBR deck or a massive discovery document for an implementation that I'm going to send you as an attachment in an email one-on-one. -on -one. That, I mean, yeah, email is digital, so forgive me. But like after sure. the one-to-one -one QBR that we do, I send you an email attachment with a, PowerPoint, with a bullet point list of follow-up actions. That's the old way. That's one-to-one. -one. Accessibility and digital customer success is I upload that QBR template with follow-up actions in a, in a place that is 
accessible by your entire team that maybe lets you view your support cases and all of your other touch digital touch points with our company in the same place. So I think digital CS for me, scalability obvious, but accessibility uh, is important as well. How do you access all of the materials or the activities that the customer success team is doing in one yeah. place? So in some ways it's about how adoptable, we think about adoption of the products that we work with the CSMs. We don't think enough about the adoption of the CSM activities or collateral that we're doing with the customer. So I think accessibility right. really factors in there as well. So those are my two buzzwords. It's a long elevator ride, but if you want to make it a short one, scalability That's and cool. accessibility as it pertains to customer success. Yeah, I like the accessibility because we we get that wrong a lot. You know, we 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 put a, a QBR deck together or a deck together or some yeah. sort of resource, and then it lives somewhere. You know, it's sent via email, which is where things go to die sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, and I would love <laughs> to understand the statistics. You know, you just think about the the. This, this really kind of gets me, right? And um, I guess I'm, I'm feeling extra curmudgeonly today, Alex, so I apologize great. in advance. But Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Great for everybody. Uh, it's, it, it really gets me because the amount of time a CSM will spend bringing this QBR deck together versus the value they get after that 30-minute meeting Golly. is completely just, just, it's just off. It's just off. I mean, you know, the, the QBR is kind of like the pinnacle. It shouldn't be, but it's the pinnacle of some customer success playbooks. And that executive maybe pays attention for half of the Zoom call, certainly doesn't open the attachment in the email. And you're lucky if they open the email. So what are we doing? Uh, I think that's, you know, that's a microcosm of, a, of I guess, yep. the, the turbulence. As you know, turbulence happens when two types of air merge. So you got the old one-to-one -one engagement style and all the digital stuff. And these things are not really fitting together like they should. And that's where you get the accessibility yeah. problem. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, QB, the Q, QBR has been steadily becoming a naughty word for a long time, right? Because I think a lot of folks just don't, <clears throat> when it comes time to QBR, it's like going through the motions. It's like, okay, now I know I need to create a deck and I know I need to schedule a time with everybody. And that's invariably going to change a couple times and, you know, uh, and I'm going to spend literally like three or four hours putting this together with, with data from desperate, yeah. you know, disparate systems that don't talk to each other and all this kind of stuff. Whereas, you know, I think, I think you're onto something because I think any good digital program should enable a CSM to put those kinds of things together in a better way, whether it's, you know, whether it's totally futuristic and it's like, generative AI created videos and all that kind of stuff, or it's literally just like, you know, populating the right data in the right place. Yeah. So you can easily, you know, make a deck if that's even what your customer wants, right? Like uh, how yeah, many of us right. have asked our customers, do you want a QBR? Or do you just want like a check-in every once in a while? How do we drive your goals forward? And, and I think, you know, there's something here, it kind of goes back to accessibility, but the maybe even more basic than that, you know, the QBR process or, you know, the, even the customer journey, a lot of times we're bringing our customer through our process instead of tailoring our process to the customer's need, right? So, yeah. you know, we do a kickoff call, we do a project steering committee, we do a QBR, all these things, they're, they're little moments, you know, say it's a three-month span. They're little moments in the three-month span that say, hey, I'm here, let's talk about value, don't forget about me. But, but yeah. all the stuff the customer cares about is happening every other day in that period. So how do I make sure that, you know, if they want to look at their adoption data, they have that available to them either in the product or in a supplemental dashboard somewhere, right? How do I make sure that our tech stack that they engage with is navigable and not, you know, your support portal over here and your LMS over here and then email attachment or Google Drive folder with your QBR decks over here, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's, for me, the future of digital customer success is, is ultimately like one customer centric overlay so they can engage with all of their information as, as, uh, as they choose. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe we'll get into it a little bit later. We did some of these things at a previous company um, where we launched a customer community <laughs> when we had 84 customers. Um, right. And those two things don't sound like they're congruent, but uh, they sound incongruent. But the uh, reason was we wanted to have a cover sheet that linked all the underlying systems. So the customer went only to one place to access all of the things that were digitally available to them. That's funny. Uh, in one of the previous episodes, I forget which one 
forgive me, but um, th- we were talking about the fact that, you know, onboarding emails tend to be this thing where you send your customer links to every single system in your tech stack, whether it be the community and the support site and the LMS and the thing and the, and this thing and that thing. And it ends up being like 10 different links or five different links even. And, and so I love that concept of, of pulling it all together under one roof, so to speak. And, and, and I, I do feel like that, you know, we do have a lot of systems and we have a lot of lot in our tech stack and I think it's just getting more confusing now that generative AI right. is entering the picture as well, because it's adding yet another thing to the tech stack. Um, so, you know, I think I think the the I don't know what you call it the enterprisation of all of that, yeah. <laughs> or the you well, know the unification of all that into one place is 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 brilliant. Well, I think you know, for for me, the journey for software, like let's just think about us as buyers of post-sale technology to support customers, right? First, it was, you need a system for that. Support team, got a support system. Training team, got a training content management system. CS team, I got a CS platform. And then those platforms said, hey, wouldn't it be nice if your customer could self-serve? So they created a little self-serve widget. But without really thinking about it, we created an org chart tech stack that our customer has to navigate. So instead of giving them the one customer experience engaged in one place, I've outsourced the columns in my org chart via technology to the customer, right? And if we really zoom out and think about that, it doesn't make any sense. Um, So that's what we set out to do by really kind of trying to integrate, uh, you know, we lost adoption. Our business case for buying the community platform at Cognite is where I spent two years leading the CSM team and community teams together, um, Oslo-based industrial data, uh, data ops scale up uh business case one of the first things i wanted to to purchase actually and we had screenshots of the 12 different systems that customers could go to to get information or do something and Mm -hmm. you know to get stack overflow lms a couple of wikis and documentation sites we looked at usage data for the ones that we had and it was terrible it's just you know we were investing in all these things and nobody was using them because as you say if they can't find that one email i sent them in onboarding i feel like my you know a lot of companies say, oh, I sent you the links. You didn't access them. Well, they're inaccessible. I, you know, think about it. I, as a customer of you, I think about you 1% of the day. That 1% will not be occupied in all the links you sent me. It's going to be about your product. Yeah. Right? So there's, you know, again, I'm not trying to be a broken record, but that's the accessibility piece. It is. Yeah. It's important. And, and you think about that customer journey and so many often, so often we think about the customer journey as like this, this string of events that needs to happen. The conveyor belt uh, but we think, of events, but really. you, the conveyor belt, but we think about it a lot of times out, you know, outward facing. Yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people have put the energy and the emphasis on actually experiencing it as a customer. You know, like put yourself through the in the customer's shoes and see, okay, what's confusing and what you know what doesn't fit and how many emails am I getting and all that kind of stuff. And so I think yeah. I think your point of accessibility is a real good one, just because. It does put all that stuff in one place. Um, I feel like we could talk about that forever, but I do want to ask you um, about the Customer Success Excellence Awards and how that came about, and you know where that came from in in, yeah. in your brain, and and how it started, and what it's evolved to today. Yeah, how it came about. So, well, let's start with the elevator pitch. That one I, I do have well rehearsed. Um, <laughs> customer Success Excellence is the uh, world's first award program, awards program dedicated to the customer success profession. So uh, sales, they have their, you know, different regions have sales excellence awards. There's customer experience, customer service awards that have been, you know, existed for a long time. But back in 2019, it felt like it was about time to have our own. Um, yeah. So, you know, in typical fashion, uh, I didn't think about the consequences and said, screw it, let's do it. Uh, and kind of put the idea out there back in 2019, um, got a website. I was, uh, uh, I was in between, I was in a notice period. It was actually 2020. I had the idea yeah. in 2019, did some things in 2020 to get it out there. I was in my notice period between two companies, um, just joining Cognite actually, uh, had this uh-huh. left the previous company and we were in our first COVID lockdown. So I had Time on my hands plus time on my hands, uh, let's right. say. Um, yeah. So we got the idea out there. I think I was really 
when the first lockdown happened, the game grow retain CS leaders office hours really took off. Some of your listeners, sure. I'm sure will remember that it still yeah. exists today. Um, but you know, everybody was thinking, what the hell am I going to do? Customers are going to cancel. What is this new normal? Uh, and people just got together and poured their, you know, their heart and soul out into helping other people. And I was just had a really good opportunity to meet a bunch of CS leaders, talk to them. And that's how I found my judges. Um, so back to, to what it is, we have 40 judges. It's a meritocratic awards. This is not a popularity contest. You don't win by number of emails or number of votes or number of submissions. It's yeah. a thousand word or more long form application process that is judged by 40 of the industry's uh, best and brightest judges uh, across five categories. CS leader of the year, customer success manager of the year, customer success rising star. That's somebody that's been in the profession for two years or less. And then there's two awards for innovation, most innovative customer success initiative and best use of technology and customer success. Mm. And the reason we exist is really to, to find the next guest on your podcast, because I think there's a challenge in the CS space where there's a lot of talkers, uh, but there's even more operators that don't talk. Yeah. And we risk the same talkers coming on the same, you know, different podcasts and creating a echo chamber of messaging that's not moving our profession forward. So how can I meritocratically identify those operators that we need to invite into the discourse to drive our profession forward through innovation and through sharing the things they're already yep. doing? Uh, and that's why we exist. Well, 75% uh, of the reason we exist. The other 25% is we do the final awards. Uh, so, so it's regional. We, done, we do EMEA and Americas, and we're looking at APAC in 2024 as well. It's in person, and we take the short list down to finalists at a awards gala uh, for customer success. You think the Academy Awards of CS, right. uh, we did it in London in 2022, as you say, in San Francisco in 2023. And we're looking to do EMEA and Americas in 2024 uh, for the next kind of cycle. So um, cool. yeah, it's been a, uh, that's what it is. And it's been a really exciting project. It's gotten to find a lot of great people and, and really get back to a profession that's given me so much as well. I love, I mean, it, you know, you, it definitely ticks that box. Like, you know, you, I think, um, it's very seen and appreciated and the response, you know, I've, I've seen online to, you know, this last one especially has been overwhelming. And yeah, as soon as the winners were announced, even, even the finalists, like I was on LinkedIn, it's like, cause that's right around the time that I was, you know, launching the podcast. I was like, Hey, Good. let's, let's talk. And so, you know, Ralphie's been on, which is great. There's a couple Amazing. more in the hopper. So, uh, it's, it's good. So thanks. Thanks for that. You, you, you. <laughs> I'm ready to help. I'll send you the bill, brother. There you go. Yeah. It's good. But, but, you know, to your point though, um, had it not been for those, I mean, Ralphie, for example, is extremely brilliant, uh, smart, driven, yeah. personable. And, and, uh, and just context for the, for the, for the listeners, uh, she yeah. won customer success leader of the year at the America's mm -hmm. awards. Uh, and, I think I said this publicly before, but it wasn't close. I mean, she was head and shoulders right. above everybody else. Uh, yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and so, you know, it, it, uh, it, it I'm not sure if I would have approached her otherwise, because she's not necessarily part of that echo chamber. You know, you, you look, you look for the, yeah. I love that quote, you know, that a lot of people use now, um, from, you know, Fred Rogers, which is, you know, look for the helpers and, and I don't think the echo chamber people are necessarily the helpers, but people like Ralphie who are kind of, yeah. she's not, you know, crazy active on LinkedIn and stuff, but the things that she does are so impactful and so kind of helpful to the community and stuff that that's, you know, those are the people that we really need to amplify. Well, and, and if we zoom out, you know, we're a young profession. We're a yeah. profession that is maybe getting more responsibility now where new business is less fruit, um, the, you know, the, it's not low hanging fruit anymore. we got to work harder for our new dollar. And that means we need to focus on existing customer expansion and existing customer growth. But we're, we're a young profession and we're not a big one. You know, you look at the amount of CROs and uh, people that lead professional services support teams. There's a hell of a lot more of them than there are CCOs or CS leaders. Sure. So, so I think we shouldn't underestimate the need to, to invite new voices to share their perspective. Because otherwise, we get 
people that take the same QBR playbook to every company and thinks that think that is what customer success is. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's really what we're trying to, to, to attack. You know, that's a, that's an action word, but I think it, it, it needs to be used here because, you know, we got a lot of opportunity as CSMs to really kind of bring the customer led growth era into SaaS, let's say, but if we squander that, we, you know, that's on us. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Um, my brain just went five different places all at once. So I'm in, I'm, what you're looking at is me wrangling it back in. But one of the things that I think I'll is give you interesting, minutes, yeah. Yeah, good. right? Yeah, one of the things that's <laughs> interesting about what you just said is um, this notion of taking a playbook from one place to the other, you know, and plunking it in isn't is probably the least realistic play, r- least realistic action within CS of any other organization like sales, you have a marketing yeah. funnel that leads yep. to, you know, opportunities that leads to close rate, et cetera, et cetera. There's a predictability there. You don't necessarily get that in CS because, you know, the product is different. The goals are different. The, you know, like there's so, there's so many variables there. And so th- this kind of leads to my next question, which is to say that, you you know, you've been part of some you know, pretty cool companies in a in a customer success leadership role and um and primarily you've been kind of startup scale up focused right and and so i'm curious what advice you might have to other you know cs leaders who uh you know may have been part of a large organization and looking kind of to get into the 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 smaller orgs uh, yeah. startups or, or folks that are coming up that that want to ascend into leadership in those smaller orgs yeah, good question. I mean, I, I fair sale that company I spoke about was acquired by a large enterprise, and I've stuck around for a year and didn't love it. Um, so I'm maybe not the guy to advise enterprise people about kind of going to startups because um, I think it's probably not a true statement. But in some ways, you're one or the other. Uh, yeah, and I don't truly believe that, but I think there's definitely some uh, sure uh, make, making the, making the leap between both is not to be underestimated. Let's say uh, from one Absolutely. to the other. Yeah. Um, uh, I, from my perspective, one of, the, one of the challenges in customer success is the broad definition. So I'm a chief customer officer and my function is called customer experience. And we have a CSM team, but a lot of VPs of CS are responsible for CSM, but also uh, uh, maybe onboarding and maybe support, maybe professional, you know, maybe, maybe training, right? So mm-hmm. we have, um, you know, I guess I, the challenge I'm trying to articulate is there's a little bit of a variable definition of CS, But then also, if it goes bad in any other function, it impacts CS. So I think this challenge in a startup where there's very little process or discipline or even kind of, let's even say, you know, in the worst case, management buy-in for your function, right? Sure. What is the CS thing? It sounds fluffy, but we need it. Okay. Uh, And obviously, you know, it kind of depends on your your leadership as to, to whether they get it or not. But I think the challenge you have in doing this in customer success in a startup is you can spend a lot of time telling other departments how to be more customer centric or how to, you know, link up and collaborate with them better. Example, is sales selling to our ICP? Or are they selling anything? If I invest in that, I have a better time dealing with my customer. But if I don't invest in how we deal with customers, then I've shot myself in one of my feet. Yeah. Similarly, I got to invest in linking product feedback from customers to product. And I could invest in that. But if I don't invest in the actual customer success department, then, you know, I'm kind of focused on other stuff that I don't own, but it still impacts me. So it's this trade off of breadth versus depth, let's call it, Um, because I think at a startup, the challenge is we're actually at at a company I work for today. It's called Nazaza. It's a travel tech platform Um, and basically think like Shopify for buying trips online. You can add a bunch Mm -hmm. of different products to your basket, check out one itinerary. Um, more B2B, uh, but our customers are B, you know, B2C, so it's B2B2C. Um, sure, sure. And we didn't have an onboarding function when I joined. We've created one. We didn't have a CSM function, which was doing CS. They were just kind of doing everything. And we had a support function that was functioning well, uh, and but doing a lot of onboarding because we didn't have onboarding. Um, right, so, yeah. so we sorted some of those things out, and we also have one person whose role is to run all of our digital programs as well, and that's new. Um, but, but the point I'm trying to make is, you know, we... In a leadership offsite in May, one of the values we're kind of talking about what are our company values and what's kind of the, the culture we want to instill in a, a high growth organization. And, and I didn't really know how to articulate it, and I still don't because it sounds weird. But this idea of kind of living at the margins or 
living at the overlaps because where you know there's a there's a, a term that, that one of my uh, um, colleagues or a professional um, I said friend he's a friend yeah. uh, told me he basically called it um, he says accidents happen at handovers right we were kind of talking about basically sure. the, the the conversation was do you have onboarding or delivery hand over to the CSM after sales or did you hand it over all at once? So the theory was one handover only because that, that's where accidents happen. And that's exactly the point. So the value we were talking about was, okay, uh, we should live at the margins or live at the gaps or the handover points. And that was really what we we're trying to instill in a leadership team. So we're not looking downward and insularly, right? If I'm a new product leader or startup, I got to sort out how I work with my engineers and fix my own stuff. No, no, I need to look up and meet that CS leader that's trying to improve the customer to product interface and really meet them at the margin. So it's a very long winded uh, answer to your question, uh, which, you know, I've done, you can tell is my development area, Alex, but uh, <laughs> long elevator rides, man. You give me an, no, an elevator pitch. We're at the top of the Burj Khalifa, tallest building that's, in the world. That's, man. that's the, that's the, that's the title of your, of your book. Long elevator. Good. Well, and well, exactly. Um, I chopped an every <laughs> tree in the world to write that book, man. Too many pages. Uh, but just, just let me finish by saying, yeah, sure, sure, sure. uh, to answer your question and, and to actually get an answer here, I think advice for people who want to do CS and startups is learn to feel like the job is never done and manage that stress because, you know, you want the perfect process. Oh, this customer dropped off at this point in the customer journey. Cause we didn't think about that scenario. It's so yeah. easy to get stuck in those little kind of exchanges that don't go exactly right, but you're starting from nothing. Mm -hmm. I had a colleague once I, I don't remember the it's basically the agile delivery methodology and he basically said look to, look you're guilty of doing it the wrong way i'll give you the example if i want to drive if i want to go somewhere i got two choices i can build a skateboard a scooter a motorcycle and then a fancy car or i could build a wheel of a fancy car a door of a fancy car a roof of a fancy car and then put right. it together to have a car but the, the second example, I'm not driving until the end. The first example, yeah. I'm driving and I'm building and I'm iterating. So I think mm -hmm. in a startup environment, you have to embrace that skate. You know, we didn't have a skateboard a week ago. Yes, this customer suffered, but many more customers would have suffered if we hadn't have built our skateboard. Um, yeah. So I think that to me is the most important thing when it comes to doing CS at a startup. Um, yeah. Well, and there's an investment analogy there too, because if you're if you're going, you know, from skateboard to scooter to whatever it is, you know, you're not just taking inc incremental steps and getting to the end product, you know, in a better way, but you're also, you know, building up that juice, that yeah. customer juice, you know, um, and and I like what you said about you know, kind of living at the margins because. Uh, you know, having been part of some massive organizations and some tiny organizations, the difference is really astounding because in those massive organizations, there are 10 other others of you somewhere that you never talk to. And there, there's, there's like, here's your walls, here's your cubicle, yeah. and this is what you do. And in smaller companies, you don't have that option. You know, it's, it's, you, there is no option to disappear. It's like, yeah. you know, and, and you should be connected with at the hip with your peer in product and your peer in support and your peer in sales and your peer in wherever, because guess what? You are the customer journey. It's not on paper. It's you, right? Well, you're spot on. And I think, you know, in a startup, there's chaos. The question is where, you know, there's, there's, there's different areas or degrees of chaos and your job is really taming it. And, you know, we start with the skateboard and the scooter, but I think the trade-off is I could build my perfect process to take product feedback and get it into sprints. So the product and engineering team are just doing this and working on refining that. But that's you've tamed the internal chaos, right? Yeah. And the customer says, "Well, where's my product feature? Uh, you know, I I asked for this ages ago." And yeah, you have a good process internally, but the cust then then you're essentially saying, "I'm going to tame my chaos internally and do my ops and make them more efficient." but I'm not gonna invest at all in making sure the customer sees a streamlined and connected Nizaza or whatever the name of your startup is, right? So in, in some ways, investing in taming chaos for internal processes and exchanges implies you're not investing in taming chaos for how the customer experiences their journey through your company. And maybe mm -hmm. that goes even back to this accessibility concept where when I have a support system that has a little customer portal, I've tamed my support chaos. 
but yeah. the customer doesn't want to have to log into that site and this site and that site. So there's customer adoption of the material chaos that you completely right. ignored. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I, um, one of the things you said earlier about your journey at Nizaza is around the fact that you've just installed, or maybe there's recently installed somebody to handle kind of your digital yeah. programs and whatnot. And so it kind of, that kind of leads to my next question, which is to say that, you know, um, I think with any startup, the temptation and probably the right way to go is you focus initially on very heavily on one-to-one -one relationships. You have, you know, people who are, know the customer inside and out, you know, on an individual basis and can kind of watch over that, but that's not scalable. And yeah. any startup wants to, you know, wants that hockey stick to happen. And so I, um, I'd like your kind of insight into at what point do you feel like you should start to invest in those digital motions? Do you, do you feel like that's something that you need to like start from the ground up ground floor and start building up? Or is that something that you install as you go, as you need it, as that hockey stick starts to happen? Oh, if, if you do it, then it's too late. And I've had right. a luxury at the Zazo where we invested in digital and technology before we had a scale problem. We mm -hmm. still have 73 customers. Right. Yeah. So we're not a ma you know, massive organization. We've got, you know, around 5 million in recurring revenue. So we're a startup. Um, and part of the reason we're investing in these digital, the, the good thing is we didn't have the onboarding team. We didn't have the success team doing success things. So we had a blank canvas. So yeah. the choice was, do I paint a picture? You know, do I paint one picture? Do I, you know, this is a weird analogy, but paint a bunch of pictures. No. Do I go to the photocopier and create a bunch of pictures all at once? How about that? It's a little better. Still weird. Hey, there you go. Um, yeah. yeah, well, not really, but that's okay. Um, well, it's the, almost like do you, do I paint do I paint one picture and then a few months later or years later do I paint yeah. over it with a completely different picture? You nailed it. You brought it home for you for me. That's my <laughs> analogy. Uh, I don't know. Good. You're going to get a lot of uh, complete this analogy emails from me because I clearly struggle <laughs> and you really get it. Uh, it's the trainer. I'm, I'm, the trainer. There we go. Exactly. Um, but, but so, so we have a real opportunity to invest, to start from scratch. Instead of turning one-to-one -one activities into digital, it was let's build a spinal cord or a central operating core of digital motion and supplement with human contact. And, and I think, so let's talk a little bit about what we did. And then I want to talk about how we positioned it to customers as well, because I think we did a really smart thing there. Uh, what we did, uh, first, we didn't have an onboarding team. So the so first thing we did was we said, first, first thing was roles and responsibilities. Support was doing onboarding, but only doing kind of reaction-based onboarding. And mm. customer success then was just doing assisted onboarding as well. And the product's relatively complex. You know, we're selling complicated itineraries that have to connect to all these supply systems. Sure. Um, so it's not built to be used out of the box. You know, there's a setup period. And we just, as a company, just hadn't invested in any type of one-to-many training or onboarding materials because we could cope with people with that one customer and that one customer over there. But then we were really starting to scale and we needed to do something quickly. So first yeah. thing was, okay, support, you're not gonna get involved in any customers until they are handed over to support after go live. So that reduced caseload, let them focus on, you know, making sure the knowledge base is accurate, deflecting cases, whatever. But that team also was well-staffed and had existed for a long time. Onboarding, we created, uh, and they essentially were responsible for setting the system up, signing off the project and moving into support. In customer success, we said, okay, you're not doing product stuff anymore. You're going to get introduced at the point of kickoff. So onboarding and CS come together. You're going to get a handover from sales. And your job is to speak to the executive, get their business goals aligned, and, you know, sense check progress along the way. And then we, you know, after spending all this time talking about QBRs, we do them, but only for the top two segments of our customers, which is less than 25%. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things we did first, which was segment our customers so that if we were going to invest in one-to-one -one supplements, it was only for customers that gave us a big amount of revenue and had big revenue upside. And I think that's also really important. You try and take all your customers and create a program for them. You're going to end up always tinkering, always building the car door, the car wheel, trying to piece it all together. So we said, no, no, let's define the roles and responsibilities first. Here's your goals and objectives in each phase and onboarding your KPI is this you know, figure out kind of how to do it. And let's then build some supplemental tooling in your toolkit that you can use at the appropriate time. So that mm -hmm. was all the process stuff. In terms of systems and technology for digital, we invested very quickly in uh, Pendo. Um, this is, um, this is not, I, I don't even know if they offer this solution anymore, but 
<laughs> I think I was the one that's as funny and it doesn't, I don't think breaches any NDAs about their prices. Sure. So I'm not going to say how much yeah. it costs, but I'll tell you the package. I think I'm the 1% of, I was joking with their sales rep. I'm the 1% of people that 0.1% that converted from a LinkedIn ad. And basically it said, are you a startup? Check out Pendo for startups. And I clicked to the next page and it said, if you're 75 employees or less, you can get a great deal. And I looked at our HR system and we were 74 employees. Perfect. So he had called me the next day. I said, look, we're very motivated <laughs> to make a deal. <laughs> so, you know, we got kind of basically a, a good product for a, a cheap price. Yeah. Um, and we started building. Uh, we we yeah. brought somebody from the product team to own Pendo because it sits right between mm -hmm. product and CS. Absolutely. Guides, live. We, we basically, we had a starter product that's you know, much easier to use. We basically said, we're not going to put any onboarding resource on that because we don't have any capacity. You know, we don't have enough people for the onboarding we need to do. Turn it into digital onboarding. So we spun up digital onboarding guides. When you log in, you get a pop-up, trains you in the product, you're live, you're done. Um, and we did that very quickly. And then we invested in some project management tooling to automate some of the more complex products onboarding with links to guides directly in Pendo. So really integrating our tech stack, but then the customer kind of sees just one place and at least it links them back into other stuff and it's not in their inbox. Mm -hmm. It's in yeah. a system they go into to, to manage the project. Um, so those are some of the digital initiatives. I guess last thing as well, we invested in a tool survey tool, um, it's a company called They Said, and we set it up to just run. So after onboarding, it sends the onboarding survey and it sequences it. It's basically almost like outreach for surveys. So it'll do a right. sequence based on data and then we're getting that data right back into our company and then we're reacting. So we don't have to think about, do I do my big NPS blast now? If the data is right, the surveys are going to the right people at the right time. So really kind of building this backbone of automation that then lets the person jump in and react based on live data Instead of being monitoring their dashboard all the time, they react when something happens and it's the digital program that drives their reaction. Um, one, one, a part of my personal definition of digital CS is getting the right content to the right contact at the right time, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you just, you just hit on that, right? Because so many times we send out surveys wanting to get some feedback, but it's like, you know, a, you're lucky if you know who to send it to, but yeah. B, you send it to them at you know at a completely horrible time in their renewal cycle or whatever it is. Yeah. So using using that that data at a pendo that usage data and, and and really figuring out when those right times are is, well, is critical, I think. And, and if we were a company with ten thousand customers, we'd still be planning to implement it, right? So again, this is that blank canvas. We can just quickly iterate, figure out the data we need from our mm -hmm. CRM and just go. And then yeah, we can tweak it along the way, but we're, again, we're building the skateboard, we're building the scooter, we're not building the fancy car yet. The one thing I want to yeah. come back to, I said, there's an interesting way that we articulated this to our customers. Mm. I did a um, customer tour when I first joined and we kind of had a, a bit of, um, we, we already kind of knew the stuff we wanted to invest in, right? Uh, in terms of uh, the, the initiatives for CX department. Um, but based on those conversations, we refined those is initiatives and kind of sense check our, th sense checked our thinking. And then in the QBR or the, it wasn't quarterly and it wasn't really a business review. Every time sure. we go back and see the customer, you know, the tier one and tier two executive, we go and travel to every couple of months, we give them an update on their use of the tool, kind of that basic, um, usage stuff, but not just the product roadmap, we give them an update on the customer experience roadmap. So we really got them to buy in and say, look, this is the stuff we're gonna do to make your users' lives easier. Here's what we're gonna build in the product, and here's what we're gonna build in the program that supports the product. Mm -hmm. And actually, this analogy goes even further, we run our customer experience initiatives in a roadmap in Jira, and I, I do have an internal calendar invite for me to write release notes for the last six months worth of releases that we'll share internally to yeah. kind of drive communication, what we've done. It is the calendar invite that I keep moving to the next week and the next week, but one day, because I've said it on a podcast, I'll actually get that, get that done as well. But it's been mm -hmm. really, it's been a great way for us to unify the support, the onboarding, the CSM functions. These are all your initiatives. Here's how they link together. And here's how we're going to speak to our customers about them in a release style. So we can drive mm -hmm. adoption of the stuff we're building. That's meant to help them drive more adoption of the tool that we've sold them. Uh, yeah. That's been really impactful. Um, I, uh, uh <laughs> there's been several times where I've wished that, uh, uh, you know, my customer base would know where they are in our internal, uh, journey, 
In other words, we've got this, you know, we've got this great journey map and we've, we've outlined all the steps, but what a lot of times what we fail to do is we can, we fail to actually communicate to the customer where they are either in the onboarding process yeah. or, you know, kind of in where, where are those milestones that they need to hit to be successful? And so, you know, I like, I, I love that you mentioned that you're really just, you know, trying to pull the customer into that messaging as well and trying to have them be, you know, part of it instead of, you know, us just well, driving it. You know, and, and it strikes me as obvious and that sounds a little bit braggadocious, but, but it, it wasn't obvious until we kind of came up with this, this idea, it's simple. There's a quote that, that my colleague told me the other day, any idiot can make something complex and yeah. only intelligent people can simplify. And let's think about it for a second. We spend all this time with our customers saying, here's our product roadmap. What do you need in the product? Oh, it's on the roadmap. It's not on the roadmap. Here's the update. Mm -hmm. But then, and then as a CX organization, we say, hey, give me your feedback. Tell me, tell me what you think about this. Give me your feedback. How can we be better? But the stuff they're telling us is not about the, just the product. We have a roadmap for that. It's about the experience around the product. Mm -hmm. So why then don't we have a roadmap for the stuff that we're building and delivering to improve their experience around the product? To me, those things are actually quite complementary. And also, you know, as a CC, you know, I wish our product team delivered faster. I think every CX leader does. So sure. I can use the CX roadmap as a way to show progress of the things that I can control while waiting for yeah. big new features from our product team. I love using Jira for those reasons. Like, you know, I've been I've been a Jira user for about a decade and and you know, it's been such a great way. It's not just for product and engineering. It's a yeah. great way to organize your activities yeah. cross-functionally. And you know, and there's other tools like that too, like, you know, Monday yeah. or whatever, but everybody's got Jira. You got you've got it already. It's great. Yeah, use it. I, I I agree with you on the Jira comment. Confluence. It's been it's been years, and I'm still struggling. But that's a separate. Yeah, yeah. I need a glass of something to talk. I about said that. earlier that that email was where things go to die. I think actually Confluence is where things go to die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, look as we as we kind of wrap up, and and I'm 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 crazy appreciative of your time because I know you've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit more about what's in your content diet when you get time to read or listen to podcasts or do whatever it is you do. What what are you, what are you, uh, what are you absorbing to stay real to, to kind of stay on top of things? Yeah, good question, man. I, I um, aside from the digital customer success podcast, uh, <laughs> <Whatever>. I <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> Who? What? Uh, you know what? I am. Um, Let's just come out with it. I don't read books and it sounds yeah. super lame and boring. Um, I read blogs and I like, I read, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn far too mm -hmm. often. I have mm -hmm. a very bad habit. I have, I have LinkedIn is my content diet, I guess, you know, and the classic Saster, sure. Kel blog and, and um, I think there's Lenny's something is a new one I've just gotten put onto, uh, you know, if it's on Twitter or LinkedIn, I'll read it. If it's in my inbox, it's one of the unread emails that I kind of Basically, they go to the bottom of the inbox and I'll, I'll go through and read all of these at some point and then I just kind of delete them you after don't. six yeah. months. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So there's that. Although I do, I have two bad LinkedIn habits. One in, one that I've gotten over was I would save for later all these articles right, uh, and never come back to them. Nope. And actually, this is actually how we tried to make like customer success excellence like a thing at the start. I, I, did, I did this thing back when I was like really into the echo chamber of LinkedIn all the time thing, you know phase of my career, I guess. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> I basically created this. I said, follow this hashtag customer success excellence every day. I am sharing an article. I said from the, the vault and I basically said, I have a very bad habit of saving articles and not reading them. So why don't I share all the things that I've saved from other people over the last year? And I made the hashtag customer success excellence because I knew in two more months, I was going to launch customer success excellence. Right. Yeah. to the world. So like that was my attempt at marketing. Um, so that's one bad habit, saving articles and not reading them. My new bad habit is I s send the article in an email to my work email mm -hmm. and then not read it. So read it. I'm, yeah. yeah, that's my content diet. And I think that's probably the I, worst answer you've ever had. 
on no, that not at all. I'm yeah. I'm equally guilty of emailing myself stuff that I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know I'm going to read later, and then I absolutely don't. Um, I am also equally guilty of not reading as much as I should yeah. uh, for reasons I've mentioned before on the podcast, but I just fall asleep when I – like reading puts me to sleep. I don't need drugs. I need blogs, man. Short and I sleep. don't need melatonin. <laughs> I just need like – three or four pages of anything and i'm asleep audiobooks that's a different story but yeah. i just said yeah and when you said that i said short and sleep but i meant short yes. and sweet but i think actually sh short and sleep makes more sense short and when sleep. it comes to re yep. re reading yeah. reading these things yeah. You're blogs is about my limit yeah i'll, I'll yeah, read a amen. good blog post for amen. sure absolutely yeah. and um, actually i will it, say i will say on that I have always been obsessed with points, miles, travel. And I, mm. for the first time in my career now, work in a company where there is some relevance to the personal passion that I have. So I can get away with not just reading business blogs, but travel blogs as well. And it's this beautiful marriage of uh, yeah, personal and professional passion. So you I guess that. that's up yeah. to reading. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's that's good. That's good. Um, anyone you want to give a shout out to, kudos to that that's doing cool things in digital? Yes, actually. And I'm going to share one more bad habit. This is really turning into therapy now. Oh, uh, sure. Which, yeah. You know, that's cool. I'm, I'm that's, here for it. I'm here thanks, for man. it. Thanks, um, man. Appreciate, mm -hmm. appreciate your time. You, you thank me for, for my time. I should really be thanking you for yours. You should you charge me by the hour for this work here. Um, <laughs> going through, you know, going through bad habits together. Uh, one of my other bad habits is I have a million draft LinkedIn articles that I've never published. Um, yes. Yeah. So that's another one. But actually, I... When I first joined Zaza and knew I needed to do this digital CS thing, I spoke to, I kind of put out a bat signal uh, and said, hey, who's an expert in digital CS that wants to talk to me for half an hour and just educate me on this on this thing? And I have a half written article about the things that I learned. So cool. I won't tell you the, the outcome because you can all, your listeners can gang up on me and hold me accountable. Um, but I spoke to some really good people in this space. Um, Angelica Merrick, she was a Bazaar voice at the time. I don't know if the places are still accurate because it was so long ago that I created this draft article, which is an equally uh, even more embarrassing, but that's okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, Dickie Singh from Cast.app. They're a, he's uh -huh. the CEO of a very interesting um, uh, tool in the digital success space, automating QBRs and other things. Yeah. Um, so basically turning the one-to-one -one activities into one-to-many. So that's super topical. Um, cool. Cool. I spoke to Annie Dean from Recast Success, Lauren Cummings from Can Do, um, Marco Innocenti from Zoom, and Jeff yeah. Beaumont from GitLab were also super um, helpful in kind of giving yeah. me an education. And the last person I'll mention is Dan Ennis from Monday.com. Oh, and lastly, Chad from Customer. Uh, and that's all the shout outs I want to give, but they were uh, really helpful in basically just telling me their experience. And I think the one takeaway spoiler alert for the article I'll never publish was that, uh, uh, they all had different definitions of digital customer success. Sure. Um, some people were focused on email. Some people focused on in product. I talked to, to them a lot about how does product marketing and CS kind of work together in the communication. And the conclusion was not well. So I think we have a, a huge opportunity to really kind of, um, synthesize what it means to yeah. do digital CS well. But, well, yeah. what's interesting about that, so first off, awesome names. There are some who have been on the podcast. Those of you who haven't been on the podcast, ex expect a LinkedIn message from me shortly. So it's, it's a pyramid scheme. It totally basically. is. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Um, but the other cool thing that you just mentioned is something that I found too, because as you know, you just witnessed, I ask everybody their definition of digital yeah. CS and um, been putting that on the website, digitalcustomersuccess.com as a word map and to have everybody's definition on there as well. Um, which nice. has been interesting because, you know, it differs depending on where you've been and what you do and, you know, yeah. your, your past and all that kind of stuff. But there, there's some, there's some constants there. Um, lastly, how, how can people engage with you, find you and interact with you, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so I guess maybe the, this is kind of I guess my 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 thirty second pitch time. Um, totally. Or even if it's not, we're gonna we're gonna steal it, it. It absolutely is. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you. I'm glad to do it with your permission. Uh, so I guess firstly, customer success excellence. We talked about as I mentioned, we're doing awards in 2024 across the world. Uh, you yep. can register your interest on our website. Uh, it's a simple form: name and email, and we'll email you when your region. Well, it's name, email, and region. When your region is up, uh, we'll email you, and and you can get involved more. Also, stay tuned. We're 
posting a series of video, video interviews with our winners. So you can kind of hear directly from them why they won. You know, it's great to give awards, but you know, if they need to, to, we need to get their story as, as you have done with some of our winners already, Alex. Um, and then on LinkedIn, I would say, if you drop me a LinkedIn email, here's a question for your listeners. This has really, really confounded me. Is it a linked inbox or a LinkedIn inbox? That's a key question that I would like people to answer. But the reason I mention it is regardless of what you call it, I struggle to manage that. So connect with me on LinkedIn, maybe give it a few yeah. tries if you like. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to speak to people who have questions or comments, or they yeah. just like to share their opinion on the name for the damn thing. I'd really yeah, like LinkedIn in, 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 inbox in exactly in, in your LinkedIn inbox. I mean, the marketer says LinkedIn box, but the, uh, I, your, I think your, it's right. But you know, your, I, your support I, engineer would say LinkedIn inbox. Well, exactly. I have the beholder. What a weird way to end. That's what I'm here to do. Um, but it's yeah, good. for those that dare, those are how to, that's, that's how you can contact me. Uh, uh, I appreciate me your, your energy, your enthusiasm, especially at, on a Friday evening after what it was probably a long week. Um, I appreciate your humor. Most importantly, though, I appreciate um, what you do for the CS community and the CS Excellence Awards. And it's just goodness all around. So Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Alex. A summit of the Alex is now concluded. Until next time. I don't have a gavel. I need a gavel. <laughs> next time. There you go. <laughs> thank you for joining me for this episode of the Digital Customer Success Podcast. If you like what we're doing, consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps us to grow and to provide value to a broader audience. You can view the Digital Customer Success definition word map and get more details about the show at digitalcustomersuccess.com. My name is Alex Turkovich. Thanks again for joining, and we'll see you next time.